Peter Huang, and I'm the president and CEO of Tapimmune. We are a publicly traded company listed on the NASDAQ, so I encourage you to refer to our merger proxy statement for a complete uh, description of our risk factors. So we are in the midst of closing our acquisition uh, with, merger, uh, with marker therapeutics. So um, we expect to hold our shareholder vote on October 16th uh, with a closing following shortly after that. Um, and after which we will uh, begin trading under our new name, Marker Therapeutics, and the ticker MRKR. Um, so as many of you may know, we announced uh, the acquisition of Marker Therapeutics back in May. Uh, and coming out of the announcement of the acquisition, we also announced that uh, we are raising $70 million in a private placement transaction led by NEA, Perceptive, and Aisling Capital. Um, after we complete the transaction, we will be moving the company to Houston, Texas, uh, renaming the company Marker Therapeutics, uh, and uh, rebranding the company. So with that, let me talk to you about our cell therapy platform. So we have a transfor uh, transformational T-cell therapy platform that allows us to target multiple target antigens simultaneously and requires no gene modification of T-cells. Moreover, this approach has generated in early clinical trials what I think uh, I can easily characterize as robust clinical uh, results with uh, minimal toxicity to date. So if you look at the field, I will tell you that I think that it's a fairly clear list of things that are proving challenging in the CAR-T and TCR experience. That is that um, CAR-Ts and TCRs have generated very, very interesting clinical results in terms of responses, but inconsistent. Uh, not only that, but we've seen that they are very uh, inconsistent in their ability to generate durable clinical responses. Within ALL, initial response rates of 90%, uh, if you follow the patient for five years, uh, seem to fall to as low as 20% of those complete responders who hold the complete response. In lymphoma, uh, the, the, the cliff is actually steeper, where in the first year, we typically see 40% of those patients lose their complete response within a year. Many of the, uh, many, much of this is due to the limitations that surround single antigen targeting. That is that um, we know as an evolutionary escape mechanism though, that if you are only able to target a single antigen, that sooner or later you will see antigen negative escape. On top of this, we see significant clinical safety concerns related to the use of CAR-Ts and TCRs. CRS, or cytokine release syndrome, is the most famous of the toxicities, but it's not the most serious. In fact, um, neurotoxicity, the me mechanism of action which we still do not well understand, um, has proved to be a program-ending threat uh, to several CAR-T programs. Uh, moreover, if we gene modify a T-cell and put it into a patient, the FDA and the EMA mandate that we monitor that patient for 15 years uh, to ensure that we do not see an adverse mutation um, that arises uh, from that genetic modification. Moreover, T-cell therapies like CAR-Ts and TCRs are extremely and mind-bogglingly expensive. Approved products today uh, charge uh, upwards of 475,000 per patient. Um, and that's due to the fact that the cost of goods of manufacturing a gene-modified T-cell product is extraordinarily high. So with that, what I will say is that I believe that our therapy has the ability to address all of those issues. So what is, uh, so what is our therapy? Our therapy is predicated on the fact that if you are only able to target a single antigen, that you will invariably get tumor escape. It's a well-known uh, phenomenon in, in immunotherapy where if you have blue T cells, and even if they are effective at killing all of that blue tumor, what we know is that residual tumor that does not express the blue will survive and will grow out and you will see a patient relapse. And it's only by targeting multiple target antigens that you're going to be able to do complete tumor cell killing up front uh, and thereby stave off uh, antigen negative uh, tumor escape. Our product uh, today is uh, um, a donor derived product for AML that targets four different antigens WT1, Prem, Survivin, and NYSO1 or an autologous product that we use in multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and our solid tumor studies, 
the targets Prime, Mage A4, NYE So One, SSX2, and Survivin. Uh, we can do blood draw by either Apheresis or even by simple Venipuncture because we need a very, very small amount of blood. In fact, only 100 to 400 mils of blood. After taking the blood, we, uh, the manufacturing process is exceedingly simple. We mix uh, the, the patient's monocytes, PB, uh, PBMCs, our proprietary PEP mix, and uh, a mix of cytokines in a $300 device known as a G-Rex. There's no further manipulation of the T-cells required. We repeat that stimulation uh, as needed, and then uh, we withdraw the T-cells, wash and freeze, and because we use such an extraordinarily small dose of T-cells, that is that the highest dose of T-cells that we have ever used is 20 million cells per meter squared. That, that is correct. A maximum of 40 million cells per patient. Um, this can be done as a less than 10 mil infusion. It can be done in an outpatient setting. And because we've never seen toxicity in our patients, we can do a 10 minute infusion, monitor that patient for an hour, and send that patient home. So what does this mean from an efficacy standpoint? Here I'm going to show you 13 patients that we dosed with active disease in lymphoma. Um, here, what I will point out is, first of all, remember that these patients are extraordinarily refractory. In fact, if you look at patients number 1, 3, 5, 7, 10, and 12, you'll see that these patients have failed up to 10 lines of prior therapy versus the 2 to 3 that is, uh, that is customary for a CAR-T patient. I can say with confidence that none of those patients would have been accepted onto a CAR-T trial and that it should be as surprising that you get any response from those patients at all, much less the level of response that we're seeing here. You'll see in the green the complete responders, 6 out of 11. That is a 55% complete response rate in lymphoma, which falls very nicely uh, on top of the 54% uh, that uh, Kite reported in their uh, study of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients. Um, in this case, the, what I'm going to point out to you here is that we have extraordinarily long durability of our results. That is that over half of our complete responders are, more, are durable out beyond two years. In fact, several of the complete responders are approaching four years in complete remission. By contrast, uh, when Kite did its comprehensive data update in December of 2017, the longest lived complete responder that they were able to point to was only 23 months in, uh, in complete remission. So I can tell you that half of our complete responders are more durable in complete remission than Kite's longest lived complete responder. Moreover, what I will tell you is this, that unlike in a CD19 car, where you typically see upwards of 40% of patients relapse within the first year, we have yet to see a lymphoma patient who generated a complete response relapse with disease. In fact, I'll show you in a bit that even those patients that did not develop a complete response, those that developed stable disease in this case, went longer before seeing disease progression than did Kite's partial responders. Because our therapy is inexpensive, non-toxic, and because our T cells by nature persist, unlike a gene modified product, we can use this therapy in an adjuvant setting. Here are 17 patients, um, one of whom was dosed twice, who have received our cells uh, as an adjuvant therapy, as a maintenance therapy uh, in remission from their lymphoma. And here, what I'll tell you is that we cannot make a definitive statement about efficacy with a single arm, non-randomized trial. But what I can say is that our colleagues at Baylor ran a retrospective study on the first 12 patients that were treated with this therapy. And what they found is this. When it, they knew that these patients were very refractory, and so they looked at the best remission that these patients had ever seen prior to the use of the T-cells. And if you take an average of that, the average is four months. In fact, in this case, when you look at the, 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 the uh, duration of, um, oh, I'm sorry, there are your adjuvant patients. When you look at the duration of, of their, continu uh, their continuing complete responses in this case, 37 months, 17 months, 29 months, 
12 months, 19 months, 16, 25, 28, 20, 15, and 18 months, we can definitively say that we have generated the best continuing complete response that these patients have ever seen. In fact, uh, what the Baylor clinician told me is that he can put his hand to his heart and say that there is no reason in his mind that these patients should be in continuing complete remission absent the use of our T cells. One of the reasons that we've given you this level of data is that you can delve into each of these patients individually and you can see that their case studies support that conclusion. For example, look at patient eight who is in continuing complete remission 25 months post DHAP. That simply is not something that you typically see. So here, let me put our, our results in context. This is the Kaplan-Meier graph provided by Kite. And you know what? Um, if you listen to Adrian Bott at Kite, he'll tell you the same things about this data that I'm about to, which is that Kite is seeing the best complete response rate they've ever seen at 54%. Now, the green line represents their complete responders. And what you can see here very clearly is that 35% of those complete responders have fallen off by month 11. Moreover, what's not shown here is the number of patients at risk. The vast majority of their 101 patients were measured still between month zero and month 12. So what we know as an artifact of the Kaplan-Meier graph is that some of those patients will relapse and lose their complete response. And when they do, this Kaplan-Meier will continue to kick down. Moreover, when you look at the, the, the orange line, the line of their partial responders, you can see that Kite typically loses all of their par almost all of their partial responders within two months. With markers therapy, once again, I'm going to point out that we have never lost a complete responder in lymphoma to disease relapse. And in fact, half of our complete responders are longer in their, their uh, CR than uh, Kite's longest one. All of this is done in the face that we know that with CAR-T, toxicity is synonymous with uh, efficacy. So Kite reports that 95% of their patients get a grade three or higher adverse event. Only 13% of that is CRS. In fact, the vast majority of their toxicities are, are much more dangerous, life-threatening toxicities. 79% of those patients get a grade three or higher neutropenia, which is life-threatening. Almost one in three, 28%, get a grade three or higher neurotox. Neurotox is exactly the sort of thing that shut down JCAR-015 from Juno's program um, and really um, conceded the CAR-T race to Kite. One in five, 21%, get a grade three or higher encephalopathy. Compared to that, we saw zero adverse events amongst our lymphoma patients. In fact, in over 60 patients dose to date, in three different indications. We've only seen one adverse event that was judged to be of grade three or higher and related to our T cells. In fact, um, I'll show you that patient in a bit. That may be an artifact, uh, but ir irrespective, it is an extraordinarily low rate of toxicity. So here is patient number five um, that we showed you in the active lymphoma trial. This is a patient with active Hodgkin's lymphoma. You can see that that tumor spot is resolved, that patient SUV went from 5.7 to under two, clearly a complete response. What I'm gonna show you in the top right-hand corner is that this tumor was a high expressor in SSX2 and NYSO1. And our T cells, uh, specific to those antigens, expanded significantly. But here, I'm gonna show you uh, data that, uh, ev that represents the holy grail of cell therapy today. As you know, many of the cell therapy companies have predicated all of their 2.0 programs on generating epitope spreading, but no one has yet been able to show consistent evidence of it. What I will tell you is that we have seen evidence of, of significant epitope spreading consistently in our patients. So in this case, we see uh, T cells that are specific to MAGE-C1 and uh, MAGE-A3 expanding post-infusion. We did not put those T cells in the patient. What our T cells are doing is they're migrating to the tumor, they're causing necrosis, they're secreting cytokines, and they are turning a previously immunosuppressive environment into one that is capable of recruiting the endogenous immune system to participate, and that is one of the reasons that we believe that we are getting superior durability of our results. 
Here's patient number two in the lymphoma trial. And the thing that I'll point out here is that when we started dosing patients back in 2012, earlier than the inception of most modern CAR T-cell programs, the FDA was, was concerned enough about um, a multi-antigen product that they forced us not only to dose escalate, but also to antigen escalate. So we dosed the first two patients with a single antigen, waited six weeks. This is one of the patients from cohort number two. And so here we see that um, when we see epitope spreading to mage uh, A4 and uh, NYC ESO1, that's epitope spreading. What I'll tell you is that our, our product adapts alongside a patient. And so here, if we just used a Prame or, or, uh, or uh, NYC one TCR, we likely would have lost this patient. Why? You can see that by month nine, those T cell populations are subsiding. But here, when the, the tumor migrates away, it starts to become a MAJ4 expressing tumor, our product adapted alongside it. Um, being mindful of time, I'm gonna skip to AML. So the lymphoma data is our most comparable data, but it's not our most impressive data. Our most impressive data is in post-transplant relapse refractory AML, for which you cannot use a CAR-T. In fact, the only available therapy for these patients is a donor lymphocyte infusion. Their overall survival expectation upon relapse is four and a half months. You can see here that we generated a complete responder who's durable out to 15 months, a partial responder who saw a significant reduction of disease um, and was able to be taken to another transplant that put him in CR, and two stable disease patients, both of whom survived out beyond their, disease, uh, beyond their survival expectation. One of them did so well that his doctor took him to a second transplant and put him in CR. The other one saw only isolated relapse in the skin that was treated topically. That complete responder is an amazing case. She started out as a patient in our adjuvant trial. We gave her cells. She generated the only adverse event we've ever seen, a grade three elevation of liver enzymes. The doctor tre treated that prehepatitis condition with prednisone. Turns out she took her Vicodin twice the night before, and that's probably what spiked her liver enzymes. But we judge it because we can't say it's not our T cells to be an adverse event related to our T cells. When they gave her prednisone, they flattened our T cells. And guess what? She went into a significant relapse. She got uh, major extramedullary lesions in her jaw and along her spine. But when the liver enzymes went down, the doctors withdrew the use of prednisone, our T cells rebounded, and guess what? They, they virtually eliminated those tumor lesions. In fact, she did so well here that the doctors decided that they were gonna try to wipe out that residual tumor by giving her decitabine as a consolidation therapy. The decitabine ablated our T cells, and rather than helping, it put her into a full relapse. At that point, we asked the FDA to move her to the active disease arm of our trial. They agreed. We gave her a second dose of T cells. These were not remanufactured. They were simply a cryopreserved set of cells that were identical to her first dose. And immediately she went into complete remission. She's been durable in that complete remission over 15 months. The last time she came in for follow-up, uh, the doctors tell me she was more concerned about relationship issues than she was about her AML. That is a patient that at this point had a four and a half month survival expectation. Um, being, uh, at this point, I will uh, end uh, without going through the data on multiple myeloma. Let me just say it's equally impressive, but let me tell you that um, after we announced this data, uh, we were honored to have Jim Allison, uh, who this week was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine, uh, join our SAB along with Pam Sharma, uh, recent winner of the Coley Award. In addition, Malcolm Brenner, founder of Baylor Cell and Gene Therapy, and the former president of the American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy also joined our, our scientific advisory board. Uh, Malcolm is the former president of the ASGCT. Helen Heslop is the current president of the ASGCT, and she also joined uh, coming out of our announcement. So I will tell you that um, between our new investors uh, and our scientific board, I think that we are extraordinarily pleased by the amount of validation that we've received from uh, the scientific and investor community. Thank you. Thank you.